Hello, and welcome to the New Books Network. My name is Matthew Jordan, and I'm an instructor at McMaster University, a science communicator, and a funk musician. I'm very excited today to be speaking with the author and the illustrator of a new book called The 100% Solution, A Plan for Solving Climate Change. To understand the title, I'll quote a line in the book, Climate change impacts get exponentially worse until the problem is solved 100%. This book proposes that 100% solution. The author is Solomon Goldstein Rose, a lifelong climate activist, former Massachusetts state politician who at the age of 26 has spent more time thinking about and taking action towards solving climate change than most of us probably will in our lifetimes. The illustrator is Violet Kitchen, a Massachusetts-based artist whose work is whimsical and educational and, in my view, totally makes this book. Solomon and Violet, thank you both so much for joining me here today. Thanks for having us. All right. So before we get into any specific questions about climate change, I'd love it if you could start by briefly introducing yourselves beyond what I've already said and maybe giving the listeners a bit of background on your work and your interest in this topic. Solomon, maybe we can start with you. Sure. So I've been a climate activist since age 11. And when I was in high school and going into college, I thought I was going to study engineering and invent a revolutionary solar cell and have it be you know, electricity cheaper than coal and save the world. And that would be that. And it didn't go that way. I ended up shifting into studying public policy and realizing that there was one, there was a lot more beyond solar even if we had really, really cheap solar, there's the problem that the sun doesn't shine at night. So we need electricity storage and all sorts of other systems. And then uh, eventually I asked myself, okay, what is the comprehensive global picture? And I had gone in this political direction. I ran for state rep. um, But I returned to this engineering mindset of physically what is needed to add up, what can actually add up globally by the deadline set by scientists, which is 2050 for net zero global emissions. And so I I went back to looking at this from a a standpoint of what's the comprehensive picture, engineering-wise, what adds up. And that broadened my thinking a lot. That led to the creation of the book. That led to a lot of outreach that I've done to experts and fellow activists and professors and such over the last few years. Great. And Violet? So I'm Violet Kitchen. Uh, I'm a visual artist with a background in illustration and comics, and um, especially an interest in educational comics and, um, you know, using the medium of visual arts to, to further education, you know, science communication. And um, I've been an artist since I was a very young child, um, largely self-taught. Um, and... Yeah, I've long been had an interest in climate change, but um, it wasn't until I really began working on this book that it was in the process of working on this book that I was able to um, better educate myself on the technologies and policies really needed to address it. And it it actually gave me a much more optimistic outlook, I think. It, it, yeah, and it really furthered my interest in uh, doing more of this type of work. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about how the book turned out. And, um, yeah, it re- really... Really looking forward to doing more of this work going forward. Great. Um, how did, in particular, this collaboration between the two of you come about, Solomon, when you were writing this book? Did you know that it, you wanted it to have such a pro- prominent visual component? And, and how did you two end up collaborating? So we've been friends for a few years, and I was talking to Violet and another friend of ours about the research I was doing in this 100% solution framework that was coming together, I think before I even decided that it should be published as a book. And there was a question of, well, hey, could we do something together visually, make it into a a really short graphics-based presentation of this framework? Or should it be a whole book that's heavily illustrated? There was a version in our minds that could have gone in the direction of basically a graphic novel um, or something more like that. Violet, you want to say more about how we developed the idea of, of what the visuals should be like? Yeah, so there was sort of a long back and forth period where I wasn't even necessarily officially involved in the project, but we were 
continually having conversations about, you know, the best medium for this information to be presented. And, you know, I came at it from the perspective of having this interest in uh, educational graphic novels in particular and talking about, you know, how comics can be used as a, as a form for, um, you know, presenting visual information in a way that's, you know, really accessible and easy to understand and, you know, still manages to, you know, really get to the depth and substance of an argument. And so, you know, we had many conversations where we were just, you know, speaking in terms of hypotheticals. Well, what might this kind of book look like? And it ended up, you know, it wasn't until, you know, much later on in that process that we sort of cemented the idea of, okay, this is actually going to be a book and I'm going to be the illustrator. And from there on, we basically went through all of the major arguments in the book and dissected them one by one and talked about, you know, what were the weak points in terms of being able to communicate an idea? Where might a visual illustration help the idea along? And what might those illustrations look like? And it was a very collaborative process from start to end. Um, and I obviously came at it from a much more visual background, but, you know, Solomon coming from a much more, you know, technical and engineering background. And together, I think we were able to, you know, blend our talents, you know, in, into, you know, something, um, you know, that, that would have been, that ended up much better than um, either of us would have working alone. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And the, uh, yeah, the, the, the presentation of this book, the, the combination of the text and the graphics, it's really, really phenomenal. Um, I'd like to, we can get much more into some of that later on, but I'd like to pivot specifically to some questions for Solomon about climate change and this book. Um, first off, what exactly does it mean to solve climate change? So you could debate this, but I use the phrase solving climate change to mean reaching the point where the impacts of global warming are getting less bad rather than worse. And to get to that point, you have to bring atmospheric greenhouse gas levels back down towards pre-industrial averages. Um, and that was wordy, so I can go into that for a moment. Climate change is driven by cumulative levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere um, that exceed what they're supposed to be, basically. For thousands of years, there were roughly steady levels of greenhouse gases um, over human history. And in the last 200 years, really 150 years, it started to climb a lot in an accelerating way. and each year, we are adding more and more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere through that year's emissions. People think of the emissions as being the problem, but actually it's the cumulative levels of CO2. So reducing emissions 50% doesn't reduce the impacts 50%. It reduces the additional worsening of the impacts some amount. And it's not linear either. The, at some point, we might reach tipping points where it accelerates dramatically, or there are sharp changes to climate systems, and it's all a bit unpredictable. And so that's why you want to keep levels to to what we are confident will be safe and adaptable. So solving climate change means getting to the point where we stop emitting greenhouse gases and start removing them from the atmosphere so that the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the temperatures that are causing climate change impacts eventually get back down to historic averages. And doing that in time that the maximum impacts, the irreversible changes that are caused by whatever maximum temperature we reach are something we can adapt to and something that isn't so catastrophic that we, we irreversibly lose key ecosystems that the planet's survival depends on or key aspects of human civilization or something um, that, that would cause irreversible chaos and, and unadaptable climate sy systems. Yeah, one thing that you emphasized really clearly in the book that that I really appreciated was that unlike some other uh, maybe global issues that we can solve, for instance, uh, world hunger, if you go part of the way to solving world hunger, well, at least you've made some people, you've given some people food and made them less hungry. And that's 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 progress, whereas climate change is a function of not only the emissions that we continue to put into the atmosphere, but everything that's ever come before. So as long as we are continuing to pump 
uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we are exacerbating the problem, even if we're pumping fewer greenhouse gases. That is to say, if we cut emissions right now, tomorrow would still look exactly the same because the historic emissions that have all come before would still be there um, ca- causing the uh, the devastating effects of climate change. I think that was a really important point that you uh, emphasized very very clearly in the book. Yeah. Um, so, um, what, maybe you can say a bit more than about why you really emphasize this need for the 100% solution. You talk about a lot of, you know, 10% solutions or partial measures, but why specifically, and maybe you can speak to the title as well, do we need this 100% solution to solving climate change? Yeah. So this comes from the, the, the fact that climate change impacts continue getting worse and worse and worse even as we reduce emissions more and more and more, as long as we're still emitting any greenhouse gases each year, that's worsening the problem. So getting to zero emissions and in fact net negative emissions, that's when we get to the tipping point of impacts starting to lessen rather than worsen. So that's the, the point that I call solving climate change, as long as we're confident that that, that will continue in negative emissions and that that's not a, a momentary thing. Um, and so getting 100% of the way there is necessary before we will see any lessening of impacts. And so we can reduce emissions 80%, still adding emissions every year. We're still making the problem worse and worse. Obviously, it's better to have 80% fewer emissions than we do now. And that will add less additional impact in the future, but it will still be getting worse and worse. Uh, so Getting a 100% solution means we need to totally eliminate emissions, get into negative global emissions before we will see any lessening of impacts. And so that has to be the target that we keep in mind. It's not an issue where you can say, well, we'll continue to make slow and steady progress. Um, Because also, as I noted before, the time that you do this matters a lot. If you get to negative emissions in 200 years, temperatures will have continued increasing all that time and will have reached, you know, six degrees Fahrenheit more than, or six degrees Celsius, maybe more than, you know, than industrial, pre-industrial averages. And we will not be able to adapt to that climate system. If you get to negative emissions by 2050, you might keep total warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius and we can probably adapt to that climate system. There will be certain species that go extinct, and that's sad, certain ecosystems that get really disrupted. But by and large, m- most parts of the world r- will survive. Humans will be able to adapt, and we'll be able to go from there. So the timing matters a lot. 100% solution means not just eventually reaching 100% emissions reductions, but reaching that in a time frame that's meaningful to avoid unadaptable catastrophic climate change. Right. That makes sense. You profile in the book five key pillars that are part of your framework for achieving this 100% solution. I'll just read them out quickly. We can get into them soon. Key. Uh, so the, the five pillars are clean electricity generation, electrification, carbon neutral fuels for things that cannot be electrified, shifts in agriculture and other non-energy systems, and negative emissions through sequestration. So let's. we're just going to get into a couple of these. If people want to read your uh, explication of the others, they can, of course, uh, buy the book. But let's start with clean electricity generation, which I think many people recognize is an important source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It accounts for about a quarter of all emissions. Electricity in most parts of the world is generated by burning uh, things like coal or natural gas, which release carbon dioxide, among other things. The burning of these um, uh, materials leads to the boiling of water, which then spins a turbine, which imparts energy to a generator, which gets transformed into electricity. Um, Can you paint a picture of how electricity generation works around the world? What different types of systems are in use in different places? And what the steps are that might need to be taken 
in order to fully decarbonize global electricity systems. Yes. So what you've just described is what almost all power plants look like. Most places in the world, electricity is generated in big power plants that burn a lot of coal, mostly in some regions like the U.S. There's a lot of abundant natural gas, which is methane. Um, and we have methane power plants. In some regions, methane is not as available and it's nearly all coal. Um, occasionally, it's oil. It's burned, it drives a turbine, and then that's distributed over a grid. Uh, transmission wires that go to all parts of the country or, or the region. And that is the vast majority of electricity right now. And there are various clean options that can replace those fossil fuel power plants. And they plug in to the existing grid generally. You can have wind turbines that are driving a similar sort of generator, just instead of steam turning a turbine, it's wind turning a turbine. And you, solar is different. Solar is pretty much the only source of electricity that doesn't involve spinning something. The sun hits solar panels and it directly drives an electrical current. Uh, and that, that can plug into the grid. You can also have microgrids and battery storage with solar and wind at small scales. And a lot of people really like that vision. And I think we will go there more and more as the world into the future. But that's not very efficient right now. And it's not very cost effective, especially for developing countries where people are just getting the first access to electricity or to reliable energy in general. And need it to be as cheap as possible to be able to afford it to begin with. And so actually the, the cheapest way to add energy access for people is to have those centralized power plants, large scale solar farms, large scale wind farms, nuclear power plants, or fossil fuel power plants with carbon capture and sequestration, um, where you, you filter out the CO2 from the exhaust of burning fossil fuels. It's not ideal because you still have the other problems, the, the health problems of mining coal, for instance, um, but you can dramatically reduce or eliminate the greenhouse gas emissions. And so there, those are all clean options for generating electricity. There's hydropower, um, which drives a turbine through water. There's geothermal, where you can use heat from in the earth to create steam and drive a turbine. Um, those can both be expanded somewhat geothermal. It's possible technologies will be uh, demonstrated soon that can expand it a lot. Hydro, we know basically how much it can be expanded because there are not that many sites in the world that are good for hydropower production that haven't been used already. So if you really pushed it to an extreme, you could maybe double or triple what we have now, uh, which would not be a, a vast amount compared to the amount of electricity the world needs. And keep in mind that that demand is growing as developing countries, not as their populations grow, but as existing people in countries that are in the middle phase of development, not the very poorest countries in the world, but those where birth rates have started to come way down, education is going up, and energy access is going up. And that's a key driver of access to education and medicine and commerce and everything. The people who are currently alive are getting new and increased access to energy. That's driving most of the increase of greenhouse gas emissions in the world right now, because most of that energy is coming from coal right now. So figuring out a way to serve that growing demand for energy in developing countries using clean technologies is basically the core challenge of solving climate change. What role do you feel that nuclear power in particular plays in solving that problem of bringing clean uh, energy to, to these growing populations around the world? And why in general do you think nuclear uh, really gets people in a tizzy? Um, and what can we do to kind of maybe destigmatize uh, its importance as uh, a, a source of energy and make it more widespread around the world? Yeah. So I would say nuclear should be a significant part of a solution, especially when you're looking at developing countries where you need to expand dramatically people's access to reliable energy. The fastest and cheapest way to do that, and you have to do the cheapest way because there isn't extra money 
to to spend here um, is through centralized power plants distributing on a grid that's efficient because you can balance across distances and everything. Um, and nuclear can compete one on one with a coal power plant. That's key. Solar and wind. Sometimes the sun isn't shining. Sometimes the wind isn't blowing, and so they can't compete one on one. They're already cheaper in many cases for an additional amount of power if if that power can be intermittent, fluctuating. Um, then then solar can be cheaper than coal. But if you need the baseload reliable power that you can guarantee ninety plus percent of the time, then solar and wind simply can't physically do that right now. You need batteries or you need systems like using excess solar and wind when they're overproducing to generate hydrogen or artificial methane uh, and then put that into a a power plant and have sort of a carbon neutral power plant that could back up. So you don't physically need nuclear, but nuclear would be a really good option for that backup to at the very least balance out solar and wind. So that's the role that I think I and many people see it. And I think that the the stigma comes from the Cold War era environmentalist movement that was understandably conflated with the anti-nuclear weapons movement. And nuclear weapons are horrible and unconscionable. And people are who grew up in the Cold War were terrified of them, rightfully so. And unfortunately, they have the same word in the name as nuclear power. Um, even though the you know nuclear physics is the same basic science driving them, and there's n- little other relation of the actual technologies, mm-hmm. um, same as you know chemistry is the same technology behind uh, the chemical reactions happening in a bomb, you know not a non nuclear mm-hmm. bomb, and the chemical reactions happening in a coal power plant or you know, whatever. Like the the association though, because there are not many things in the world with the word nuclear in the title. Uh, that I think is the core thing that has led to this stigma. Um, and so I think we need more scientists to talk to people and reassure them that actually, if you look at the data, nuclear is the safest form of energy that humans have ever used. The number of people, but you know, the, the upper estimate of the number of people ever killed by nuclear total in 60 years of using it is about the same number as people killed every two days by coal. So just the orders of magnitude are so wildly different. The amount of waste from nuclear, which is something that people are really worried about, is actually considerably less than the amount of waste from solar, simply because nuclear power is so much more concentrated. And it's hundreds of times less than the waste from coal, which is, you know, all of this is toxic waste. All of it needs to be stored. And um, nuclear, we have ways because people are you know, so focused, so scared of it, uh, we've developed ways to store the waste really safely and be really conscious about it. So uh, for coal, we dump the coal sludge into open air ponds and sometimes dams break and it floods communities and poisons people and it's awful environmental catastrophes. So that's the perspective on nuclear. But I think the larger thing is the amount of electricity generation that we have to add, all of which has to be clean and all of which has to work in developing countries We have to add so much so fast that more and more climate activists and people who understand the importance of global climate justice are focusing, are are not necessarily focusing on nuclear, but are accepting nuclear as one of the tools in the toolbox that should definitely be used, that we shouldn't take something off the table. And I think that consensus in the last couple of years, basically as climate change has risen up the agenda and people have started caring more about actually solving the problem of climate change than about thinking in terms of virtue and what a a healthy, clean system of the distant future might look like, where some people don't see nuclear as part of that. Some people do. Um, But in terms of solving climate change in the next 30 years, people are increasingly recognizing that that's going to be part, at least some part. Uh, The question is how much leadership the U.S. is going to take because there are all of these cool advanced nuclear designs for small modular reactors, things that can be mass produced, things with interesting technologies that solve even the minimal safety issues that people do still have concerns about. Uh, Reactors where a meltdown would physically, it would be against the laws of physics. uh, And and that could allay some of the public concerns. Uh, But we need large scale government support for demonstration of these new technologies and regulation of them so that they can be deployed. And so there is a question of whether the U.S. will be a leader in that or whether some other country will 
take the leadership and be the one exporting these technologies around the world and making the money and creating the jobs from it. The book has some really phenomenal graphs illustrating the point that you brought up about just how safe nuclear is relative to some of these other technologies, coal and other um, dirty, you know, emitting um, uh, materials for producing electricity obviously have detrimental health effects. They, they get into your lungs. They can cause diseases. They produce an immense amount of waste as well. Even solar panels, as you describe in the book, the materials involved in producing the solar panels require manufacturing processes that generate a huge amount of waste. And then people installing um, solar panels fall off roofs and stuff like that, leading to injury and sometimes death. Whereas nuclear, uh, as you mentioned, the actual rates of harm to human beings is is very minimal. And and, and once again, there's a, a, a wonderful uh, illustration of that. I guess while we're on the theme of these illustrations, I'd like to turn back to Violet. Um, what role do you think effective design, art, and visual metaphors play in science communication and maybe in particular climate science communication? I would argue that it's crucial. I think among sighted people, um, vision is the biggest way that we take information in. And I think, you know, I think I don't think that's something that you can exclude from communication generally, and especially scientific and climate communication. You know, I, I think that illustrations turn scientific data, which is something, you know, very abstract and impersonal into something concrete that we can experience firsthand. And that experience really helps make that data more accessible. Um, you know, an illustration will actually physically put you there in that place, as opposed to simply hearing about it as though it's some hypothetical problem. And I think, you know, that can really help bridge the gap between people knowing that there is a problem and actually feeling compelled to act on it. And I think, especially in terms of climate activism, I think, again, that is crucial. Yeah, I totally agree. Even some of the uh, illustrations you had in here were almost, you know, paradigm shifting for me in terms of my understanding of how the problem needs to be tackled. There's a great picture that, that I've seen before and, and maybe many people, if they think about climate change, will have seen before of the different sources of climate emissions. You've got kind of the quarter of the pie that's um, electricity generation and maybe the just a bit less than quarter of the pie that's agriculture and the 15% or so that's transportation and all these different sections that people will maybe be familiar with if they've been kind of studying this issue. And you show you know, which of these sectors uh, will we be able to electrify or generate using clean electricity methods or synthetic fuels that don't emit uh, greenhouse gases? And then you're left with all these little slivers uh, that will not be able to um, be changed to use those cleaner methods. And so in order to account for those, we will need to pull uh, the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere with the, the process known as sequestration. And I thought that was, what a beautiful way to to illustrate that point. Um, many people have proposed that uh, one reason it's difficult to mobilize people to take action uh, against uh, on fighting climate change is that many people lack the imagination to even understand the transformation that our society needs to undergo and how these can actually be beautiful and inspiring and like this book illustrates a, a real call to action a generational call to action um i'm, I'm reminded of uh, alexandria ocasio cortez who just released some awesome posters for the green new deal um do you think that artists have a bigger role to play to not just communicate the science but to actually excite and inspire action uh, on climate activism Absolutely. I think those posters you just cited are an excellent example. They're beautifully done. And I would also argue that it's not so much a lack of imagination on the part of people as, you know, simply a lack of access to the proper data and the proper information. And I think that's, again, where collaboration with scientists and scientific communicators is key. And I think working together, you know, just like Solomon and I in this book, I think, you know, we can achieve results that are far more effective than if artists or scientists were simply working alone. And so I, I think going forward, you know, having as many collaborative projects as possible to bring this information to people is key. Um, yeah. I think I think part of what we can do to better communicate with the general public is 
to better communicate the solutions and not just the problems. I think what I see in a lot of climate change based artwork is, you know, illustrating, you know, the, 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 the you know, the results of climate change, you know, the ecological catastrophe, um, y- y- you know, we see the damage that is being done and will be done in the future, but I don't see nearly as artwork, much artwork that focuses on the solutions to those problems. And so when I see the kind of artwork, you know, it fills me with this kind of existential dread, you know, you, you, you're you aware that there's a problem, but without having the t- tools available to you to understand how it might be addressed, you know, it's simply makes us numb in a way, I think. And so we go forward being aware that there is this problem, but feeling like we're helpless to do anything about it. And I think part of what art can do is show us that, no, there are these technological and policy solutions to these problems that simply need to be implemented. And here's how you can be a part of that. Here's how we collectively as a society can, you know, not only model better behavior, but, you know, take a lead on, on these issues and, you know, implement the changes that we need. And, you know, I think, I think that's incredibly important, you, you know, and I, and I really would love to see more artists out there, you know, incorporating that into the work that they do in terms of showing us, yes, here's the problem. And also here's what we can do about it. You know, I think that helps empower people and makes them feel and puts them in a problem solving mindset mm-hmm. as opposed to a numb, helpless one, which is too often, I think, how we feel with such a big issue like this. Yeah, I, I absolutely 100 percent agree. I think all of that was really, really well said and a great point. As the illustrator for this particular project, you probably have a uniquely close look at the climate problems and the solutions that are proposed here. How did your own views about climate change and what needs to be done about it uh, change uh, after working on this project? In certain ways, they did become quite more optimistic. I think I came into this book having a bit of that fatalistic worldview of, you know, this being an issue that has spun such out of control and been so little addressed on a federal level that, um, you know, I felt I felt a little bit hopeless about it. And going into this book and actually really digging into, you know, you know, technologies and policies that, you know, exist now that just need to be implemented and realizing, you know, the realizing the specific changes that are possible really actually helped make me more hopeful. And, you know, having these, you know, tangible solutions that I could really grasp in my mind, as opposed to, again, seeing this as a very abstract problem. It it really brought home for me the fact that, you know, this is something that's still possible in spite of what we have seen in the past historically and what we're seeing now in terms of the federal government's, you know, not only indifference, but outright hostility. We're still seeing... You know, in the past two years, we've seen, you know, this grassroots movement really explode and take off and, you know, seeing the rise of, you know, climate communicators and activists like Greta Thunberg and like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, this has really made me hopeful. And, you know, seeing, um, <clears throat> you know, see, see, seeing that leadership rise, even if we're not seeing in our in our in our federal government, the changes that we need now, I'm I'm really seeing us lock more onto the path that we need to be on than I ever was before. And seeing that in, in conjunction with, you know, educating myself through this book and having a more concrete vision of what is possible and what is practical and what needs to be done has, has really given me a better outlook. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think, um, for, for many, I, I don't know why, but I think many artists maybe think that, a kind of doom and gloom uh, mindset or a pessimism is somehow more, I don't know, artisty. Uh, there's something kind of Pollyannish or too optimistic about being a solutions oriented person, which I don't know, maybe for some people feel like con- conflicts with the artistic spirit or something like that. But I love the idea that in this book, you know, the muse was this 100% solution, this idea of a positive vision towards solving climate change. And at no point is this book needlessly optimistic or starry-eyed or ignoring of the massive challenges that need to be faced, but it's motivated by a spirit of understanding the problem and recognizing what exactly the physical transformations that have to happen to our natural world in order to, uh, in order to solve it. And I think really that, um, that these illustrations are, uh, if I was an artist, an inspiration, um, 
to uh, how this type of material can be can be effectively communicated. I'm wondering, just as a final question for you, Violet, if there are if there were any um, uh, challenges that you faced, if there were any ideas that you felt uh, were particularly difficult to put pen to paper to, or whatever material you use to to, to illustrate, um, or, or that you struggled with in terms of trying to convey visually. Um, certainly, there are many challenges on in individual illustrations of you know figuring out the best way to simplify you know very technical concepts without you know misrepresenting them. You know, still managing to maintain the underlying accuracy, even as of course by nature things had to be you know pared down and trimmed. So that that was a continual challenge. But um, obviously with Solomon's input, we I think we were able to be very successful in that regard. But I also. I think you made a really interesting point just now that I'd also like to elaborate on Um, just this whole idea of, you know, maintaining a very positive outlook without being naively optimistic or, you know, discounting problems, I think was something that was very important for us both for the book tonally. And it's that in itself, I think, was also a challenge was maintaining that that balance. And I think it's something that all artists have a role and not simply in the field of climate communication, but I think in our culture more broadly, we, we've seen this zeitgeist evolve around, um, you know, very apocalyptic, gloomy stories. You know, we, I think we have this pervasive idea right now that that's what art looks like and that anything more optimistic than that is by its very nature naive. And I, I think that's something that I think we, we all, all creators have a role right now to help counteract because I think, I don't think there's any inherent truth behind that. I think that's an assumption about the way art works and, and what qualifies or does not qualify as art. And I think we all have a role in ha- having a more solutions-based mindset present in our work and you know, to understand that optimism isn't ne- inherently more naive than pessimism. And in a way, you know, pessimism tends to be far less useful, especially when we're up against something like this. And... So that that was a continual problem present in my mind as I was working on the illustrations for this book is is finding a way to to work against that. Yeah, wonderful. Um, Solomon, I'm wondering if you have uh, any thoughts as well on this idea of being solutions oriented um, or this divide between maybe the environmental pessimists versus the optimists versus the different mindsets that people take when approaching these problems? Yeah, I think being solutions oriented is absolutely key when communicating about climate change to policymakers and to the general public. And one thing that I have been thinking more and more about recently, even since the book was published and in the outreach I've been doing, is the need to be specific and this is one thing the illustrations really help with in the book is helping paint a specific picture, you know, literally uh, a, a specific picture of what climate solutions might look like. But we also need to do that verbally with political discourse, um, the rhetoric that people use, focusing less on this is a massive problem and, and making people feel fear and and also focusing less on it's a massive problem, so we need some gigantic project to do something about it, which leaves open this. Uh, unfortunately, the connotation is still this idea of sacrifice. Like we need to change our personal behavior, limit our lifestyles in order to reduce emissions. And if you want solutions to add up globally, that's pretty much irrelevant. We need to change equipment, change infrastructure, manufacture new systems, and physically replace things all around the world to eliminate emissions. And in fact, we need to do that in a way that works with roughly our current lifestyles because two-thirds of emissions come from developing countries where there's no room for lifestyle sacrifice. And so the idea of focusing on what do solutions actually look like, we're not asking you to stop driving. We're asking you to drive however much you do now and then plug in your car at night because it's going to be an electric car. That's the change. It's not the change of how much you drive. It's what car, what, you know, technology inside the car uh, you're using. And giving people that specific sense of solution is, makes the politics much easier. So I think, yes, focusing on solutions, one, you can make people hopeful that it is possible. And there are many people who care about climate change 
and feel we're doomed and therefore aren't really engaged and mm-hmm. aren't mm-hmm. being activists in a way that would be really useful if we could bring those people in. So giving people hope for those people and then giving people who are skeptical right now of solutions reassurance that this is going to be great for their lives. Actually, in most cases, it will reduce energy costs. We're going to create new industries, export new equipment, create more jobs, especially in this moment where we need some hope of building our way out of the current recession. This is key. This clean energy infrastructure, the innovation that we need to do, the manufacturing boom we need to spur to solve climate change is probably the best way to center an economic recovery plan to put Americans back to work and to have a a boom in infrastructure, create jobs that will last into the 21st century. And so that's a very hopeful message right now. It's also the only way that we will actually solve climate change globally by 2050. And so giving people the the hope of we can do it in a way that's really exciting, but also actually we we can do it. And the only way to make things actually add up happens to also be really exciting, which is great. And that's convenient, but we don't talk about that forward thinking and specific aspect as much. Yeah. I mean, the, um, I'm just excited about it. And and one thing that your book kind of inspired in me is there are now, you know, 16 different jobs that I would like to have. I want to do research on improving nuclear reactor design and build better batteries for storing solar energy. And I'm, I want to be a lobbyist and an activist and kind of share this, this, this vision, uh, with more people. And it's one, one thing that's amazing is just seeing just how many different facets of society have a role to play. I mean, every really facet of society is something your book illustrates has some role to play because the transformations are basically all encompassing, but they're going to involve some incredible new science, some great, uh, some exciting, you know, business opportunities, some governance challenges that will undoubtedly be difficult, but exciting. Um, and that, and that everyone in almost every position in, in society has some role to play in achieving this 100% solution as you describe it. And I think that's really a kind of inspiring um, vision as you lay it out. I'd like to touch on one other area. We spoke a bit about electricity, but you also talk in the book about um, agriculture and other non-electric uh, um Uh, energy generating sources of emissions. Agriculture is something like 20% of emissions. Maybe people are aware that um, growing uh, crops and and raising animals to to be slaughtered for food is a hugely uh, emissions heavy process, among other reasons, because uh, cows um, through their for, for lack of a better word, burping and farting, uh, I guess enteric fermentation is the better word, but I prefer, um, uh, cow farts. Um, releases a huge amount of uh, methane into the atmosphere um, and and merely turning land into farmland releases a huge quantity of greenhouse gas. Um, so I'm, I'm, I guess my question is, what does a emissions-free agriculture sector look like by the year 2050, according to your framework? So deforestation is probably the single biggest slice of emissions after electricity generation that you could point to as as one thing and the that's the biggest contribution agriculture makes to emissions so using land more efficiently growing the kinds of crops that are that don't require as much land to feed humans as much nutrition is going to be useful interspersing crops and livestock and and other things like that, that and just enforcing policies against deforestation and de- the relevant deforestation is tropical rainforest deforestation. Almost half of it is the Amazon in Brazil and other similar forests in Brazil. Uh, Indonesia is the next most significant, and then there are a handful of other countries. It's really a small number of countries that constitute most of this deforestation. And so that's w- w- one context we really do need country by country policy and international work to prevent deforestation but the larger agriculture piece is using cover crops using crop rotation uh, being efficient with application of fertilizer to prevent all the soil emissions cattle methane emissions and 
and other things. And of course, there's a little bit from the equipment used on farms and that needs to be either electrified or use synthesized fuels. And all of that can also be done in a way that makes the soil a, a carbon sink and captures more CO2 from the atmosphere and mixes it into the earth in a way that sequesters greenhouse gases and starts to be a larger part of the the net negative emissions that we need. Uh, The fact is, though, that this is distributed across millions of farms everywhere in the world, and we're not going to be able to eliminate 100% of agriculture emissions. Most of the emissions that will remain globally in 2050, if we do everything right, will be in agriculture. There's some amount that's just applying fertilizer, whether it's organic or synthetic fertilizer, apply it to soil. Some of it becomes nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas hundreds of times stronger than CO2. Uh, We're not going to totally eliminate that. We can be more efficient, but we're going to also have to suck some CO2 out of the atmosphere to make up for the amount of nitrous oxide that's still being released by agriculture. And so that's where the, the fifth pillar sequestration comes in to make up for the remaining emissions and then to go farther and get into net negative emissions. You mentioned their um, sequestration, which we've kind of touched on a little bit. If people don't know what sequestration means, it means uh, some form of removing uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and and storing it in some way, making sure that it is either buried underground or held somewhere or used to generate some new kinds of fuels, basically taking uh, greenhouse gases out of the sky. your book outlines the role of sequestration in the 100% solution. Um, how exactly does this process work? Is it a hypothetical future technology or something that we already have? And how should we think about what, how we should be investing in sequestration? And, you know, for young people out there, is that something maybe they should be focused on if they're interested in technology or these kinds of climate problems? The answer is sequestration technologies are both ready to go and a futuristic technology. There are all different ways that you can remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And some of them, like growing forests, are very established and fairly understood very cheap to do, come with other benefits of being able to manage forests, to have sustainable timber, to have natural places that people can hike and enjoy the the beauty, to have other ecosystems that support a diversity of species. There, You can also sequester CO2 in soils and farms. That tends to be very cheap. In fact, the, the farming practices that achieve that tend to also improve farmers' yields and resiliency and everything. So that's really good. But those only add up to a certain amount of possible sequestration per year. And so we're going to need more technological methods, if you will, like arrays of fans with chemicals that stick to CO2. And so you you literally just like filter out the CO2 from the air, direct air capture, it's called. And that is invented. There are a few companies that are moving to demonstrate it and have demonstrated small scales. Uh, But we're going to need to scale that up. We're going to need to have much larger demonstrations and bring down the costs so that we can do things like that. There are a lot of other methods that are combinations of natural and technological uh, that the book lays out. But the the range of cost is one question and and bringing down the cost of all these technologies. And then there are some more wildly revolutionary sequestration technologies that one could invent theoretically to capture much larger volumes of CO2 each year, which would be great. And that's an area for further research, definitely. Backing up the camera a little bit, it seems like that the solutions that you're proposing are huge, technologically focused, big policy, state and government and even international changes um, that as you say, enable most people to live their lives roughly the same. You're saying instead of driving your normal gas guzzling car, you can just drive an electric car. But you can still drive. Um, you talk a little bit in at, in the final couple of chapters about the things that actual individual people can do. Um, but maybe a lot of the discourse around climate change in, in the media and stuff like that focuses a lot more on those things like going vegetarian or driving a hybrid car or turning off your lights or being conscious with water and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
maybe you can talk about some of the things that individuals can do. How should individual people think about their role in solving climate change? And what are maybe some things people who want to get involved can do to make an impact? The most important thing that individuals can do to solve climate change is to advocate and vote for candidates who are going to support bold policy action. We need people speaking up in political discourse and spreading messages to their friends, their colleagues, to build more of a public understanding of, as I said before, a specific understanding of what climate change solutions will look like so that more people support active, bold policymaking. And the, the, the reason that we have not done more politically on climate change in the U.S. at the policy level is that a lot of people are still quite wary uh, and, and worried that that is going to mean something bad for their lifestyles. And so actually really de-emphasizing the personal lifestyle sacrifice piece that some people, when they ask, what can I do? They want an answer like, well, you should put solar panels on your house or you should turn your thermostat down. The fact is that those individual behavior changes by and large, are insignificant and meaningless for solving climate change. They're good things to do if you have the money to do it, if you have the the mental capacity that you want to be thinking about that. But if it's something that stresses you out um, or something that you can't afford, you shouldn't feel obligated to do that. You should feel a, a more of a sense of obligation to support the policy actions that can make the clean equipment affordable to everyone. And again, it is large scale manufacturing projects, innovation projects that we need to make clean equipment affordable for everyone in the world. And in a way that that does let people continue living basically their current lifestyles um, for people in developing countries, better lifestyles, because that's going to happen and should happen, but needs to happen without emissions. And so for individual people, it, it's a sort of two sides. One is people are really stressed out about their personal emissions. And I I'm, think we need more people to spread a message of releasing us from that stress. It's not about personal emissions. We cannot individually make choices that will get to a 100% solution to climate change. At the same time, we need people to be supportive of policy action. And so making people feel comfortable with doing whatever personal things they want because they want to do that um, and supporting both policy and also companies. I'll throw in here that consumers advocating with companies is a a sometimes powerful and, and underused tool, but getting large companies to be early adopters of key clean equipment to scale that up so that the manufacturing starts to reach a large enough volume that the costs come down that kind of thing is really significant and could make a big difference, especially where there are gaps in policymaking that that aren't going to be doing that. So that's, I I would say, individual people, don't stress about your personal emissions so much. Obviously, do whatever you can and want to, but don't think of that as the solution. Think of solutions as advocating, voting, organizing for candidates who are going to prioritize the issue. We have some crucial elections coming up in November in the U.S. And the way things are right now, we need to elect Joe Biden and a new Senate if we're going to have any chance of really bold climate policy in the U.S. That's the first step. There will be many more steps of political action and new waves of candidates beyond that to build on on the progress that I hope we'll see in 2021. But we do have a big opportunity for an economic recovery plan in 2021 focused around clean infrastructure that really does scale up all of the new technologies that we need to make affordable worldwide to solve climate change. And I'm hopeful that the movements today are going to make that happen. Yeah, that, yeah. thank you so much. That's a really um, wonderful and, and concise way of framing it. If I may also add, I think that a great thing individuals can do, especially if they're interested in in science or or policy is like you said advocate go into these fields themselves try to enter politics as you did um be, be an activist and in my corner of the world work on uh the 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 fundamental science and engineering problems uh i think there's no more exciting or cooler or more inspiring thing a young person interested in science can do than try to work on um 
you know, improving uh, solar panel technology or better batteries or um, working on improving uh, industrial manufacturing processes. I, I know that maybe to some people that sounds boring, but this book will convince you that many of these things pose some genuinely fascinating uh, engineering and, and scientific challenges. So if I may add to your um, plea for activism and engagement, uh, I would say, you know, participating and in, in researching the fundamental science will play uh, a very large role. But of course, none of that can happen without the adequate um, investment from from the government and uh, companies as well, as you mentioned, who recognize that even doing this science and engineering is fundamental and important. Um, I guess that uh, concludes my set of questions about the actual contents of the book. I'd like to ask each of you um, what what is next for you? Are, are you still doing this climate work? Are you promoting this book? How are things looking for the future? Maybe, Violet, you can start. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> as I said before, I'm definitely interested in pursuing this kind of work and trying to break more into the field of uh, educational comics, you know, educational illustration. And part of that is potentially doing more, more of a full length graphic novel on this subject. Um, but I'm also, you know, I'm also interested in pursuing other areas as well. And, um, I'm just, at the moment I'm continuing my education and, um, continuing to develop as an artist. And, um, I have a number of freelance projects going, some, some unrelated to this, but, um, uh, no, uh, you know, sorry. <laughs> um, I have a n- number of other freelance projects going, some of them unrelated to climate science, but still in the field of um, educational or scholarly work. Um, I've been collaborating on a couple of different um, biographies of, um, of uh, artists who are also social activists, for example. Um, yeah, right at the moment, I'm, I'm just I'm moving forward and, you know, just, just seeing um, where these various projects bring me and I'm looking forward to whatever is next. Wonderful. And you, Solomon? I'm trying to do outreach around the book and around the political moment in general. The pandemic has changed a lot of people's plans, including mine, and some of the events and outreach and even political engagement that I was hoping to do haven't been happening. So to some extent, I'm figuring it out and trying to be useful to climate organizations, to political candidates, to the national campaigns, and uh, anywhere else that I can be right now. So, you know, if anyone listening here has suggestions, I am very much welcoming suggestions for where to have the most impact right now. And I'm very hopeful, though. I, when I started writing the book, I was wrapping my head around the global picture, and I heard zero people talking in public discourse, in politics, in public-facing scholarship, anyway, that I could find about the comprehensive global picture, about plans that that seem to recognize the pace and scale of what's necessary. And more and more, and this has really accelerated in the last month, is like four or five new climate plans have come out. The House has Democrats put out a plan. There was this evergreen action report from Jay Inslee's former staffers. Um, just, I think maybe today, the Biden plan, the Biden campaign put out their economic recovery, clean energy plan. Um, they have a task force with the Sanders people that put out a plan. And so there's the development of discourse is really exciting right now. And all these plans are so much better than where politics was two years ago on the issue. And so I think this is a lot due to the youth movements that have gotten climate change up on the agenda. And I'm really excited to see where I can contribute and, and where all of these movements go in general, going into crucial elections this November, and then a big opportunity at the beginning of 2021 for bold policymaking. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for uh, for joining me here and speaking about this book. We have barely scratched the surface of what is actually in the book. Um, This is probably one of the most uh, informative, clear, and concisely argued books about climate I've seen. The writing is simple and straightforward. Honestly, I think even kids could get a lot out of this book. You don't have to know a great deal about climate change. The illustrations make it very easy to follow. I would definitely highly recommend it to anyone, even if you already know a great deal or really don't know anything at all about uh, climate change and what's needed to solve it. 
I think that one of the most interesting things I gained for it is a much better appreciation of a lot of these high level industrial and manufacturing processes involved. I understood, I think, electricity and agriculture, but there's a whole section on the production of synthetic fuels. I really had not thought much about how the different types of fuels that are used to um, like involved in industrial processes have to get made themselves. All the separations of various chemicals, those require energy. The generation of that energy requires the burning of fossil fuels. So it's, it's really all this multifaceted, multi-layered um, yeah, manufacturing ideas that I really hadn't thought about. So that was definitely um, a, a new one for me. And I learned a great deal there, but there's so much in here that, that we really haven't even spoken about in this conversation. The illustrations are, of course, the icing on the cake. Um, and I, I really recommend it highly. So Solomon Goldstein Rose and, and Violet Kitchen, thank you both so much for speaking with me about the 100% solution. Yeah, thank you so much again for having us. Indeed, thank you. Thank you.